pray. Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for this opportunity you've given us to gather, Lord. God, to hear from you, God, to dive in deep into ourselves. Uh, God, we pray that you just highlight your truth and your righteousness and how you desire to make us whole. So we have a purpose, Lord, to be in relationship with you. So we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So over the past three weeks, my, my dad passed. And, and uh, going into, my dad passed on a Wednesday and then uh, Thursday. I was already scheduled to teach that Sunday, which is Palm Sunday. If you guys remember, there's palms everywhere. I was already scheduled to teach that Sunday. And we were scheduling to do my dad's uh, funeral that week leading into Easter uh, and one of the things I really wanted to do was to be able to do my dad's eulogy. It was important to me uh, to be able to share the word of God about my, uh, about my dad. And, and, and he was sick for a long time. He was down in Florida. And uh, we, we actually had to move my dad up here, sell his house, move him up here to be close. He was in Sunrise and Media uh, Assisted Living. So he was close to us for about the last two months. You know, it's about a 10 or 15 minute drive to Granite Run Mall area. My, my brother lives in media, my sister lives in Chad's Fork. So it was kind of like a close proximity for us to be able to spend the last days with my dad. Uh, but literally it happened in the middle of what we would call Holy Week or Passion Week, right? Where uh, Sunday, we celebrate Palm Sunday. It's when Jesus has the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. He's pronouncing himself king. They're laying palm branches down, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Um, and, and then literally, you know, we celebrate Easter. Jesus was crucified on Friday, uh, rose from the dead on a Sunday. So I was already scheduled to teach that Sunday and then the following Sunday. And then I did my dad's eulogy on Tuesday, and then we drove upstate, and I, I did the interment, that's the graveside thing, where we finally lay the, or finally say our last goodbyes on a Wednesday. And then my goal was to take off last week, like, like listen, we're going to do all this, and, and then this chunk of time is going to be my time off. I'm going to take off a week to grieve and just kind of slow down. So... Uh, we taught Sunday and then Monday came and I was kind of still wrapping up some things on Monday and then Tuesday I get the stomach bug where I was puking for the like 24 hours Tuesday and the Wednesday like laying on the couch puking your guts up which is like the worst thing ever by the way I didn't throw up for 16 years after I got after being in sobriety and then in the past like year whatever it was I thrown up like four times it's horrible like, does anybody remember you used to shoot dope? What's the first thing that happened to you? You puke. So I made a decision. I'm like, I'm never going to do this again. It was my goal in life. I'm like, I'll never, I'll, I will, do whatever it takes, I will never do this again. And then uh, me and Emily went out to some fancy restaurant and I came home and puked everywhere. That opened the door. So I was sick Tuesday, Wednesday. Emily uh, and the kids got it Thursday, Friday last week. When, Wednesday. Whatever it was, they were, oh, Wednesday, because it happened on after school. So Emily and both the kids were puking at the same time. So here's the deal. I reached parenting, the pinnacle of parenting, because I heard these words. Emily said, Max, stop puking in my face. <laughs> Little kids getting up, puking all over us while we're sleeping. I took Max in the back room. He puked over me, like Ava's puking, Emily's puking. And this was our week. This was our vacation, all right? Does anybody want to go on vacation and... Yeah. have kids puke on you and you're like not eating anything and it's like you're just like clean up stuff this was our week but to be honest it, it, it's exactly it's not what I wanted you know I, I wanted to go to Miami Beach to be honest with you Does anybody want to go to Miami Beach sure. cool. so nobody wants to take a picture but everybody wants to go to Miami Beach right? <laughs> so the reason why I'm saying this is because it gave me a lot of time to reflect and to think about things. See, my dad's dad died when my dad was six months old, either, either, whatever, when he was six months. He never got a chance to know his dad. He was raised by a single lady from, a ta from Italy uh, in upstate PA. My dad was born in 41. So this was old school, you know, old school community. And, um, you know, you, you get to know who you really are when you have kids. Like, you think you know about life and you know what to do. And once you have 
little kids and they come around and you realize you have to be selfless because you love this other human more than you could ever possibly love yourself and you do everything for them. Like Max wants me to play and I'm explaining to him, I'm like, I go to work so you can stay home and play. You know, like this is how it works. But I realized something that my dad wanted me and I have an older brother and older sister, younger sister. He wanted us to have something so important that he sacrificed so many things in his life. What he wanted for us is to have a mom and a dad in the house. This idea of this, this parental love, we all have a different background, but there's this parental love of somebody loving us way above and beyond what we could ever possibly dream. How do I know it? Because our kids are puking all over, all over us and you're like, I love you more than anything. I remember my daughter, Kira, when she was young, she's 18 now. I remember I'm holding her and she she's like, 18 months old and she looks at me and like slaps me right in the face and I'm like I'm like I don't know what to say but like I love you you're like you just smacked me in the face and it hurt and I'm like I love you over all these things and I remember my dad as a kid I was a I was a bad kid who here was the bad kid a few of you were good kids but but I I was a I was a bad kid and uh, my, my dad used to ask me this question a lot that means everything to me today. And it's the question I, I really want to wrap our study around tonight. He would say, Cliff, he would call me Cliff or Johan, right? My name's John. Uh, sometimes Giovanni. He would say, Cliff, who do you want to be? And I think it's an important question that each and every one of us get to ask every single day, who do I want to be? Who do you want to be? I don't know about you, but I, I was a pretender and a faker for a long time, right? Like I wanted people to think that I was wealthy, so maybe I'd dress up with like nice clothes. I wanted people to think I was doing well, so maybe I'd shave and take a shower. And, you know, I, I, you know I, like I, I wanted to think people knew more than I thought so I could memorize a few things and spout them out and maybe learn a little few witty lines or, or memorize something from a movie I watched over and over again. Does anybody do these things? Oh, I'm the only weirdo? Okay, thank you. But my dad used to ask me, who do I want to be? And, and, and what he was asking me and what he was sharing is, it's always going to be the content of your character. You know, uh, so the, the word says, so a man thinks, so he is, right? So if you want to be a junkie, guess what you're going to end up being? You know, I, I wanted to be a criminal. I wanted to go out and do drugs. But this idea of who do I actually want to be? And, and, and it's all surrounded about character and integrity. And why I think this is so important for us and what we're talking about this week is we're in the fourth month and we're talking about what the fourth step means. And the fourth step is I made a searches, searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. I don't know about you, but sometimes the last thing I ever want to do is to think about the life I used to live to think about the things I used to do, the way I hurt people. I, those things come up already. Like sometimes I'm driving, I have this conversation about something I did to somebody like 16 years ago, and I'm like, oh, I'm so embarrassed, I can't believe I did that. Or I, like, why would I do those things? And, 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 and I attack myself. But the last thing anybody actually wants to do is to do a searching and fearless moral inventory of everything that you have. So I'm, I'm, I'm a drum, I, I, I do like vintage drum restorations in my free time for like stuff to tinker around with. And I have this like bin of like stuff that like I throw in. You're like, I'm going to save this. You know, there's like this dad joke going around. They're like, they're like dad uses the board he put underneath the shed in 1982 this week. Like the idea is like, hey, is anybody a pack rat? You're like, I'm going to save this one thing because I'm going to use it. But who knows what you actually have? Right? Until you start to move and start to move around, you realize you bring all this junk with you. So this idea of doing a searching and fearless moral inventory is, is something that can be completely terrifying. Why? Because you get to actually look at who you really are. Not who you think you are. The person that you've become by the choices that you made. What I can say for me is I can look at who I've become by the choices 
and the character that I did. And I'm telling you something, those are not good thoughts. Those are not things that I, I want to think, the things that I've done. As a matter of fact, James puts it in another context. We're going to look at a few verses in, in the book of James, chapter 4. If you guys want to open it, open up on your phone app. Uh, there's Bibles over there. If not, I'm going to read it. Uh, this isn't a big, long study, uh, but we're going to hit some things. A little bit about the book of James. James, uh, uh, in chapter 3, a little bit before we're coming into it, he says, um, Not many of you should become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in the word, he is a perfect man, able to uh, burdle the whole body. Indeed, he puts bits in horses' mouths uh, so they may not obey us. He starts to talk about what directs our life as our speech, this tongue. He says the most destructive thing in the world, world is this little uh, rudder thing we have in our mouth. Does everybody have one of these? Uh, it, 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 he says it can set a forest on fire. Your tongue can destroy things. You know, So he has this idea of of, of, of he starts talking about the inner character of, of this person because Jesus said what comes out of your mouth comes out of the uh, abundance of your heart, the inside. So we get to verse uh, James chapter 4, verse 1. It says this, Where do wars and fights come from among you? All right? Where do wars and fights come from among you? Um, uh, it, it can say it in a few different ways. Anybody looking at the translation right now that says something different? Yeah. What's your say? Uh, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from you? Yeah. Hold on a sec. Just relax. Where do wars and fights uh, come from? Like the, uh, There's this question. And, and this is in the essence of what we read in step four because step four, what he talks about in step four when you look at the, at the big book he says, the furthest anybody have ever got, and we talk about this a lot, is that I'm sore and it's everybody else's fault. Okay? Mm -hmm. The idea is that I'm angry and it's everybody else's fault. Well, James poses this question. Where do these wars come from? Where does this rage come from inside of me? Where is these quarrels, these fights, where do they uh, originate from? All right? What's the answer everybody wants to say? So... Listen, I'm married, right? So my easy answer is anything that's happened to me is Emily's fault, okay? Who here believes anything that happens to me is Emily's fault? Mark, Mark, her brother, all right? That's it. Thank you, Mark, for always having my back. But this idea is, and you guys all do this, right? The furthest I got is I'm hurt and it's your fault. John did it, Delaney did it, Jen did it, Emily did it. Everybody else did it. It has nothing to do with me. It's everybody else. Where do these fights and quarrels come from? He answers the question. He says, do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war inside your members? So what causes for quarrels and fights among you? The, the text says, does it not come from within? Meaning, my heart is the problem. My inner desires are the problem. When I get in quarrels and fights, does anybody have, ever have unmet expectations? Yeah. Anybody here? Right? How do we get unmet ex expectations? I develop things that I think should happen, and when this bar isn't met, then I'm sore, I'm angry, and I'm disappointed. Well, who told me to set this bar up here? My desires. I think I should get a raise. I think, which is kind of messed up because I'm my own boss, right? <laughs> That's a joke. I'm not my own boss. There's a board that I sit under and everything. So, but this, there's this idea like I should get this. I, 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 I deserve this. Has anybody said that? Yep. I deserve a raise. I show up early. The other guys on my shift don't do the work. Yeah. I've been a model employee. Whatever it is, I desire the bigger bunk. You know, what we tend to do is we look at everybody else and think I should get everybody else's lot in life. That person's got the big bed. You know, my brother got the bigger room when we were a kid. Whatever you want to put in there, we can throw everything in that box. What causes cars to find among you? Does it not come from desires within? Unmet expectations and sometimes unfulfilled promises, right? We become bitter and angry with unfulfilled promises, but it says because the desires and pleasures are in my heart. 
And he breaks it down. He says, you lust and you do not have. He said, you murder and covet and cannot attain. The covetousness is desiring what somebody else has. And this murder here, he's not talking about physically murdering people. Jesus said, if I think hatred amongst somebody, it equals murder in God's eyes. What he's saying is, it's the intent. It's the intent we need to look at. Most of us, the furthest we've ever got is we look at our actions. And it's like, no, no, you want to take it a step further? You want to be a person of character and integrity? Look at the motives behind what I'm doing. Why do I actually want to be the boss or have a raise or get the girl or get the car or whatever it might be? Whatever thing I'm searching for that I think is going to make me whole, here's the key, outside of God. The question comes back again, who do you want to be? A lot of times in recovery, people that are walking outside of a relationship with God are looking for everything to fulfill them except a relationship with God. You covet and you cannot attain. You fight and you war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. There's a root thing going on in what we're doing with this four step. Now, you really can't work a fourth step well until you've surrendered your life. You know that you have been completely deflated, right? That you came to believe that only something supernatural can restore you to sanity, i.e. faith in, 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 in God to save you. Three, turn my will over to the care of God. You've heard me say these things over and over again, this in-depth relationship we build with God. Those are the foundational spot to be able to turn and look on the inside. Sometimes people work steps and they just skip right over this and think it's just something you're going to say. And I know what people are going to say, fake it till you make it. No, no, no we don't do that. We, 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 we take the steps and we go thorough in the word of God. Now, here's the thing. As we walk with God, the Holy Spirit's going to unpull layers out and we're going to go deeper. The idea is, am I fully abandoning myself unto the Lord where I can be in this position to make a searching, fearless, moral inventory of myself. And one of the things I, I, I also realize is, is I can tell a lot about who I am, like who do I want to be. In my mind, I might think I'm X, Y, and Z. But what's your gratitude life like? Like, like, like here, here's a real thing. See, I, I remember what it's like to be in prison. I remember what it's like to be homeless. I remember to wake up what it's like with nothing, right? So why do I have anything comp to complain about these days? When I'm complaining, that's also a form of, of waging war against myself. Why? Because if I'm complaining, it's a sign that a need isn't met. Or what I think should happen isn't met. And that breeds bitterness and anger. We're going to see the result of what this war and, and, this, and this anger talks about inside the book of James. But the idea is to make a searching and fearless moral inventory that I'm able to start to address anything that's ever made me, and I'm going to say something I wouldn't say on a Sunday morning, but hurt, okay? <laughs> Who here gets butt hurt over stuff? Anytime you've ever been sore, anything that's ever made you angry is a resentment. If you're looking for a reason to blame somebody else for something, whatever it is, and some of us do have cause. There's things that have happened to us that are out of our control. I can openly say, I know what it's like. I was molested as a kid. There's things I didn't choose that happened into my life. But here's the other side of that coin. It doesn't give me the right to do anything I want today. So we do a f searching and fearless moral inventory. And it starts with being able to identify any thing that ever made you angry, the wars, the quarrels in my, in my life. And usually people say when you start this, look at age gaps. Where I, where I usually tell people to start is look at yourself. Look at the things that you're angry with yourself about, the disappointments you had in life. You're like, I wish I would have did better on that test and I would have graduated high school. Does anybody like work with their hands now? You're like, I should have been like the nerd that like studied everything, and, like did well in school and like worked with my hands. And, oh, I'm the only one that's ever thought that? Resentment against yourself for using drugs or whatever decisions that you've made along the way. Um, so th th those, those are a great place to start. He says, you do not have because you do not ask. And you 
ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you might spend it on your pleasures. So some people do go and ask God for pleasures and desires, but it's for personal fulfillment, all right? Now here's the key. God's not your magic genie. He's not up there looking to fulfill your three wishes that you have every day. And I'm going to be honest, in my addiction, I prayed for some things that were unholy. You're like, God, please, I want to do this. You know, and, and, and he's saying, listen, if your motive is in prayer to seek God for your own personal pleasure or your own personal gain, the motive is off already. Remember, who do you want to be in life? Do you want to be a person of character and integrity? Do you want to see, be with somebody that has no skeletons in the closet where you can sleep at night? Do you want to be someone that has upstanding life and consistency with other people? The first thing we have to look at is the heart. Proverbs tells us to guard our heart. For all the issues of life come out of here. My wants, my needs, my desires, everything comes out of here. And it gives me cause to either be bitter or angry or jealous or to want what somebody else has, all out of these things. And here's the, here's the funny thing. I don't know about you, but I want judgment when it comes to everybody else, but then mercy when it comes to me. You know, you're like, that Matt is messing up everything at the house. He should get kicked out and beat up. And then you do the same thing. You're like, but wait, like you should have mercy on me. Like, no, I'm a good guy, right? I'm the good guy. And you're like, aren't you the guy that voted this guy out like six times? It's true. Because if we're really going to do a searching and fearless moral inventory, you have to be searching and you have to be fearless with your inner person. That's why it says thoroughness. You've got to get to the key of your physical life, your emotional life, your spiritual life, your sexual life. Everything needs to be exposed, right? You, it's not enough to wipe away the cobwebs. We literally need to kill the spider. We need to get to the root. And James is highlighting these things amongst people in the church, that there's people still warring and waging against each other. Here's the thing. We're not each other's enemy. The Bible says that the enemy is between flesh and blood. There's like a, a real spiritual war going on. He says, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity, war with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy? Here's the key. But God gives grace to the proud, but God resists the proud, excuse me, and give grace to the humble. The proud, the prideful, the people that have no need for anything else, those are the people that God simply resists. I don't know about you, but I can just imagine being in a position where somebody tells you that they don't need you, they don't want you, and you can do anything outside of them. And then you get all messed up and hurt and you cry out to him, right? Mm -hmm. You know what? God loves humility. Jesus came humbly and low, right? So um, our, when, when I work my step four, one of the things I always want to find out is, am I hiding from reality? Like the reality of life. You know, some, sometimes some of the things I do are hard and difficult. And sometimes I find myself asking like, why am I doing these things along the way? Like, is, is, is there ways that you're hiding from reality? Um, what are things that you do now that reminds you of, a, of your deceitful heart? Um, are you still in a spot where you're angry and blaming other people? Uh, do you have an ungrateful heart? Is there gratitude in your life? These are things that lead into it. One of the theme scriptures we use, and I have some of these handouts if anybody wants to grab some uh, that, that I wrote. It says, Lamentations 340 says, let us examine our ways and test them and, and re return to the Lord. So um, a, a lot of times you hear this word reconciliation. It's actually an accounting term. Uh, if anybody wants to know more about it, probably Jen knows about this. Emily knows about this because she does bookkeeping. You got to do your business stuff. Adam does bookkeeping, by the way. Adam, you know about the term reconciliation. You want to make sure all of your columns line up zero. Does anybody remember balancing a checkbook? Does anybody do that anymore? No, you're like the rest of us. You open up your thing online and you look 
and say, oh, I think I spent that. And Actually, accountants go through and line up all the charges and make sure everything zeroes out monthly. They'll actually go and figure out everything. There you go. Um, but, but this idea of, of taking a thorough examination where we're writing out anything that ever, ever hurt me, anything that ever made me made a resentment, I get it all out first, all right? In the big book, it actually tells us to pray. Does anybody know the prayer? Paraphrased? Which one? The four-step prayer after, the, after you write your resentments. What, are you going into the fifth step? No. So, 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 no. So, no. That's, that's next. But that's actually... The, Are you talking no, third step prayer? Oh, no. We look the world in the eye. Uh, we feel as though we're walking hand in hand with the Spirit on the broad highway. Something like that. So it says we pray and look at the list from a different angle. That's to pray. God, help me view this from a different angle. After you get your resentment stuff out, the next part is to really identify the, big, the biggest one is what part you played in. All right? Now, I don't know about you, but it's easy to identify other people's parts, right? Like, look at John. He's got those giant things in his ears. I think he put them in, all right? Like, I can blame somebody else for something. What's hard is to be able to look back and own the things I've actually done and take responsibility for them and to write out, you know, I'm mad at the police officer because he pulled me over. It's his fault. I can't believe he busted me again. Like, he gave me this ticket. And you're like, what did you do? You're like, oh, I was speeding. Really? The police officer pulled you over. But you were the one that was speeding, right? So it's his fault that he pulled you over. Yeah. No, does everybody agree with that? It's the police officer's fault because he pulled me over because I was speeding, right? No. We turn and we look at another part. What part did I play in this? What, what's that? Shouldn't have been speeding. My job is to do the right thing. And, and this is that Mr. Miyagi thing we talk about with like the karate kid, like over and over you're doing this resentment thing. He's like, he's like, you're not teaching me karate. You're like teaching me to paint the fence and, and like do this slave labor work for you all day long. And he realizes that he was actually training. After you do your my part one time, 10 times, 50 times, 100 times, you're learning to look at every situation, no matter what happens to you, and ask one question. What part did I play in this? Right? That's the point of this, is to look at the situations in our life and to realize in every situation, I can only take ownership for my part in it. You know what it means? I'm the problem. I can only own my behavior and my decisions. What causes quarrels and fights among you? Does it not come from desires within? My job is to address the desires that rage inside me, the sin that dwells inside me. The, evil that lives that wants to walk contrary to God. That's my job. Now in there, you're also going to write, how do these resentments affect me? I don't want to go into too much detail, but, but they affect you in a few ways. Like um, I'm resentful at Mr. Brown. It's the, it's the, the, the analogy in the big book. Um, because he told the boss that I was stealing money and that affects my pocketbook and my self-esteem and X, Y, and Z. There's effects to to the resentments. But the big prayer that, that we start to pray over when we look at my part uh, is going into the fifth step. We take each one of these steps, you sit down with a spiritual mentor and you pray over each one of these resentments as you share them individually with someone and we say this prayer. Somebody already said it earlier. God help me view this person who I have the resentments against as a sick or injured friend. Because it's teaching me two things. You want to be a person of character? Then our job is to be humble and to realize I'm flawed. Guess what? You're flawed too. And in this world, we can, do, we can want justice from people or we can have grace and we can give grace. And what, what, what we're taught is to, um, is to own my behavior and my actions to realize I'm the problem and then anything else that happens outside of that, I'm supposed to look at somebody and say, God, help me view this person as a sick or injured friend. Anybody in the world. Anybody that you have a resentment at, 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 eventually what this is teaching us is to view people as a sick or injured friend. As you, as your neighbor. The word tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves. 
This searching and fearless moral inventory is meant to show us how broken we are, how we're the problem, and that there is reconciliation for it. There's a process that God put together to be able to to be healed. And the healing not only comes from me when we confess our sins unto the Lord, to recognize also to recognize when we're the problem. The healing comes when we pass that grace on to someone else. Because I always say it. If anybody here drives, nobody's cutting you off and saying, hey, my dad just died last week, so I'm going to freak and spaz out on you. FYI, I freaked and spaz out on Emily like three times. All right? So it's not okay to say, well, my dad died, I'm going to freak out and spaz on you. But Emily, in her mind, says, well, you know what? I'm going to treat him as a sick or injured friend. I know he's sick and injured. How do I know? He just spazzed on me, all right? You have somebody being mean, angry, yelling at you. We don't have to get a resentment and all that. We can say, wow, look at how sick they are. Look at how injured. They can't even see it. What causes quarrels and fights among you? When you're in that spot and you're blaming other people, you're the sick person. The healthy person is the one saying, wow, look at how messed up you are. God, man, that person really needs help. Let me pray for them. And I don't know about you, but that's a complete... Like 360 of how I used to, well, 180, right? You don't want to go in the same, same way. It's a complete different way of how I used to live. The furthest I ever got was I was sore, I was butt hurt, and I wanted to beat you up, and I was going to do something evil to you somewhere along the way, and I would plan it out and, and attack you in my mind. I don't know about you, does anybody have arguments with people in their mind still? You're like in the shower one day and you get in an argument with somebody you talked to like 12 years ago. You're like, oh, why are you still in my head? Resentment. And we can settle them when we turn it over to the Lord and own what part that we played and pray for that person. And this is where everything changes because the beginning parts of the, three, the first three steps are developing a relationship with Jesus. And the steps don't save you. God saves us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. These are stepping stones to walk through. The idea is to recognize I've lived life without God. Now I'm completely broken. I believe with him by faith. Now I turn my life over to him and I'm starting this relationship like we're talking. Here's the steps to work on the inner person. Who do you want to be? I wish I could be the type of man that my dad was. He was a true rock star father to me and to my brother and my sisters and, you know, uh, to his grandkids, like definitely a rock star. And I don't, know, I don't know about you, but I want to leave a legacy behind. And here's the second part of that. Each and every one of us, unless the rapture happens, which I want to happen because I don't want to die physically, but each and every one of us is going to die and there's going to be a funeral left about you. You know what people do, your family members, after someone passes? Has anybody been one of these recently? Everybody sits around and tells stories. Are they good stories? No. Uh, most times, yes. Maybe sometimes yes. A lot of times, no. Just remember, everything we do, somebody's going to tell a story about it later on in life. The question is, do you want to be the person of integrity that somebody tells those stories of? That's a solid person right there. That's the person I want to be with. That's who I want to be and tell the good stories about them, the restoration stories. That's the legacy I want to leave behind. How do we do that? Character and integrity each and every day. We can only do that when I submit my life unto the Lord and walk in his ways. Like, so many times I'm like, I want God to bless me. And you're like, are you smoking crack? I'm like, yeah. Are you stealing from people? You're like, yeah. Are you cheating on your taxes? Yeah. I'm like, working on their t- like. I want God to bless me, and then I'm doing everything outside of like his will. And it's like, you know what? What if I just followed him and abandoned my life unto him? So I think this is wonderful. Um, uh, if you guys want more information about this, I'm not giving handing these out anymore. They're up here. There's steps 1 through 12 in here if you guys want to pull them. There's like 20 or 30 scriptures in here not 20 or 30, like 10 scriptures in here to look up. There's some main ideas. There's questions to ask yourself. The hard work starts here on our knees before the Lord in his word. And I try to pull something different from a different angle. Um, Last thing I want to plug is we have these books up here in these flyers. You don't have to take these, but you can. Uh, uh, We're raising some support for our uh, Feed, uh, Feed the Faith, our food outreach program. But we have these free books called A Case for Easter. 
It's a little read. Uh, it's done by an investi investigative journalist uh, about uh, the resurrection of Jesus. If anybody wants one, they're free. We bought them. They're up here. You can have these. Um, uh, let's pray out, and then we'll get into a sharing section. Does that make sense to anybody? Step four, in depths. Let's pray. Father God, thank you, Lord, for this time. God, thank you that you're the one that searches us, Lord. Your, your word says, search me, O Lord. God, every hair on our head is numbered. You know every thought. Your word says you know every idle word that we say. You know our intentions. You see all things. You hear all things. You're all present everywhere. God, thank you that you would see that and still desire to be with us, to make us whole. We're not made for this world, Lord. Thank you that we can be reconciled unto you through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Lord. Give us new life, God, that we don't have to live the way we used to. Give us new desires and new wants to be with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.